band. Amen. That's good singing, good excitement. The roll is going to be called any moment now. And we are in DEFCON 1 as we write for the return of Jesus Christ. And it is soon. It is on the horizon. You can be discouraged or you can be encouraged. I say get encouraged. Tell your neighbors, your friends, your family, Jesus is coming soon and we need to be prepared. Amen. Amen. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank You for this time together. We thank You for the Holy Word of God, Lord. We thank You for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ our Lord. And God, I'm praying that Your name be magnified here this morning, that You speak through me, Lord, and uh, that the Word would go forth with clarity and conviction, and that, Father, we would draw ever closer to You. Lord, I believe, my personal belief, I'm not a date setter, but God, I believe it is soon. Soon you will split the eastern skies and come and capture your waiting bride home. Father, I pray our hearts will be prepared for that moment. It could be any time now. And I pray, Lord, that uh, as John the Apostle prayed, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the blessed hope of the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so let's take our Bibles. Repeat after me. I believe this is the Word of God. I believe every Word of God is true because it's impossible for God to lie. All right, so let's turn in our Bibles to uh, 2 Timothy. We keep highlighting these words and I don't know about you, for me, studying it, it, it has been a blessing to really uh, dig a little bit deeper underneath the, the meanings of these words as, as the Lord has, has told us ahead of time uh, through the Apostle Paul in his letter to Timothy uh, that we are drawing close to the second coming of Jesus Christ. He said certain things would happen. He said in verse 1, this know. This is something that you should know. You should be aware of. Uh, it shouldn't be taking you by surprise. This know also that in the last days, Paul was pointing ahead to what I believe we're living in now. Perilous times shall come. They're going to come. We're living in them. They're here. Amen? All over the place, things are happening. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. We we looked at that word back in the beginning of our study, but think about what I showed you last week. I had the video up here about the giant 2021, the giant. Man, if that isn't the ultimate of self-love. They even said it was the ultimate selfie, right? And then just the last image that's going to be on that giant is going to be the image of the beast, amen? And people are going to bow down and, and worship or die. And I want to tell you something. I, I was happy. Let, yesterday, I, I live streamed a uh, prophecy conference out of uh, California. So they were a little bit, they were, they're three hours behind us. So I, you know, it was, it was from three to five over in California, or from nine to five in California, uh, which meant it was a lot later here, the eight o'clock when the conference got done. But man, the, the, what I consider the top prophecy guys, they, they don't add all the fluff and sensationalism, um, but, uh, but uh, 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 Jack Hibbs, uh, Amar Safarte, who I love a lot, and uh, Tommy Hughes wasn't there, but Tommy Hughes is another one of those guys. Uh, Ed Heinsohn, Ed Heinsohn in one message is the book of Revelation, but I'm telling you, you would have learned from it, amen? It was Absolutely incredible. These are the top, in my opinion, top prophecy guys. Uh, uh, so anyway, uh, during the message, uh, one of the people said, I want to show you something. This is not sensationalism. This is what is happening. And a crowd, about a couple of thousand people there. And what's the video clip they show? The giant, the one we looked at last week. And I said, hey, for once, I'm ahead of the curve. Amen? Because I already showed that. And for a lot of people, that was their first, their first seeing of the giant. Man, so much is happening right now, guys. I don't see how we can deny the coming. And so, 
So this is the society, but not only the society, but this is what Christianity is going to be like before Jesus comes. Now, we don't have to be this way, amen? But this is the way the bulk of Christianity will be. Men will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, and now we're up to the Word without natural affection. Without natural affection. Now, I hope you still got your outline as I gave an outline out when we first started this. And we're still under that first main point, uh, people without character. The last days is an exceeding fierce, a dangerous time. Why? Because people will be out without character. Their supreme concern is a love for self and a lust for wealth. They're scornful contempt. They're boastful, proud, and blasphemers. They're sinful conduct, verses 2-3. through three. A sinful conduct toward parents that's disobedient and unthankful. And a sinful conduct, conduct toward people, no reverence, unholy and profane. We looked at that last week. And no regard without natural affection, truth breakers. That's where we're at right now and no restraint, false accusers and incontinent. Now, we're not going to get up to false accusers and incontinent. We're only going to be able to get to look at without natural affection. So, this, and, I, and when I found out that today was Grandparents' Day, I thought, this is great, because this really lines up in what we need to talk about. When he's talking about without natural affection, he's talking about the breakdown of the family. The breakdown of the family. You look at these Greek words and they're pretty interesting. It comes from the word stergo. Stergo means to cherish affectionately devotion and commitment to one's family. So to cherish affectionately. When you put phileo in front of it, phileo stergos, it means family affection and it is translated as kindly affectioned in the New Testament. It is the type of love we have for our parents and parents for our children. This phileo stergo. Now, when you put an A, you just take the, the Greek word stergo and you put an A in front of it and it flips the meaning. It's just, it's just like in the English. Now, when I say an A, I'm talk, it would be the Greek letter alpha. But think about in the English. You take an A and you put it in front of a word and it sometimes flips it. Like a theist is a person that believes in God. An atheist says there's no God. So it takes the meaning and it flips it. When you do that with the Greek word, and a number of these Greek words that we already covered, this is what happens, but I just didn't bring it out because I didn't want things to get confusing. But when you put an A in front of it, a, 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 and it becomes a storgos, it means hard-hearted towards kindred, without natural affection. Hard-hearted towards kindred. That means hard-hearted toward family. You're looking about at the breakdown of the family. And folks, we are living in a time, we have been living in a time for a while, of the breakdown of the family unit. Now, a longer, fuller definition is this. A longer, fuller definition is a lack of devotion to family, an absence of commitment to one's, own, to one's family, the de deterioration of family relationships, the loss of family affection, or the breakdown of the family. All that encompasses what that word without natural affection means. For some people, I, they, they just assume, well, it, it means you're, you're homosexual, you're without natural affection. No, it is much deeper than that. It is talking about a total breakdown of the family unit. In fact, uh, one, uh, one uh, scholar says this, it, it portrays disjointed families who have lost the closeness that once exemplified the traditional family. The traditional family, the Norman Rockwell family of this closeness and this togetherness and this nearness, this is just the opposite of that. And that's exactly what you see happening in our society. It portrays a day when individuals and families will drift apart. They'll drift apart. So we have to ask ourselves, what contributes to individuals and families drifting apart? 
What, what causes that in the day in which we live? You must ask yourself if things keep going the way they are right now in your own personal family, what will be the long-term impact on my family? Are we going to grow stronger? Or are we going to drift apart? In other words, how's, you, how's what you're doing working for you? If it's not working and you're already feeling the tension and the strain in your marriage and in your family, then you need to change things up because you're headed for a disaster. And this is par for the course because this is what God said was going to be like. It was going to be families without natural affection. Going at each other. Ripping each other apart. Uh, no real commitment. And you see this in families even today. Amen? And in a sense, I wish that, that Linda was here because she used to tell, tell me about uh, this one time where they, they had a get-together with all the family and she literally had to tell the kids, put down your cell phones. Because everything, all the communication was on cell phones. They're saying like, like from me and Rachel away, and they're texting each other instead of talking to each other. Absolutely incredible. And so in the family today, there's all these distractions. There's all these things going on. And all these things help us to drift apart. Now, I want to give you some statistics and these, these are from 2019, so this is pre-pandemic, which means I probably could be a lot worse right now. So, reasons why the American family is being pulled apart. So let me give you 10 things and give it to you real quick. First of all, television. Television. In the United States, there are nearly three TVs per household. There are one in the family room, one in the bedroom, one in the kitchen. I read that statistic and I'm like, what in the world would you need a television in the, in the kitchen for? And I remembered when I was a kid, when I was a kid, you had one television and it was in the living room and everybody had to watch that thing together as a family. I can remember as a family watching Happy Days and, and Laverne and Shirley and we sit in the family, family room and we watch it. I can remember, and some of you guys are older than me, you can remember maybe when there wasn't TV. But I remember there wasn't even that many channels to choose from, right? You only had a few. I remember when the remote control was me, right? <laughs> Dad said, hey, Bobby, turn the channel. Not only was I the remote control, I was also the antenna. Now, you young people, you don't understand what in the world is an antenna. An antenna was something you had hooked to your TV, and you would move it around to try to get the picture in clear. <laughs> And it's amazing, because you could get that picture looking nice and good, and then you let go and it goes all fuzzy. And you put aluminum foil on it, like somehow that's going to work, you know. And all these crazy things, you're holding it up in the air. I remember one time, I'm holding this thing up, and my dad says, that's good, Bobby, hold it right there. I'm like, I can't hold this forever. <laughs> Finally, you know, I put that thing down. It just is amazing. Now, you watch a TV and you get a blip and it's like, oh, what's going on? You know, you forget what the old days were like. But the old days, you had wholesome programming. You had family time together. Amen? But now you've got televisions and bedrooms and, and televisions and kitchens and televisions and family rooms and, 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 and people go to different rooms and watch their own program and it begins to separate the family. And then, as a parent, you need to be aware of what they're watching. First of all, it's not a good idea to let any kid have a television in their room. There is too much that they can see that they don't need to see. And they need to be supervised, and that's why you're called the parent, amen? And so you need to be careful about what they, they view. But a lot of parents aren't Christians, and a lot of parents or kids have these things in their room, and they're unmonitored, and it begins to build division and, and take away time from the family. So you have to ask yourself, do, you have, do multiple TV sets in the home contribute to the family spending time together or do they contribute to pulling the families apart? Now, once again, I'm not preaching against TVs. I'm not saying you got to get rid of all your TVs and we got to line our TVs up outside, take a shotgun and shoot them all. I'm not, I'm not saying that, amen? I'm saying shoot the producer. No. <laughs> now, now I'm in trouble. Now they're going to say, see, he's a terrorist. 
No, I'm not. I was, that was a joke. Any of the government people that are listening to me, that was called a joke. I know you guys don't understand what jokes are, but that was a joke. Amen. Maybe a bad joke, but it was a joke. <laughs> but but anyway. So, amen, there you go. Tom said, <laughs> Biden is a joke. I agree with him, amen. But, but anyway, so I'm not saying you, you shouldn't have TV sets, but you have to ask yourself, is this pulling our family apart? Or is it making it stronger? So if it's not, then you know what you need to do. So that's televisions. What about computers? More than one-third of American households have three or more computers in their homes. And I remember when the kids were going to, to school that they had to have a computer for what they were doing. It's incredible. Now, even though they have to have computers for schoolwork, we still, as parents, we just need to monitor what's going on. But here's another area in which things begin to pull apart, begin to pull the, the, the family apart as people get on their own computers doing their own thing. Uh, digital gadgets, digital gadgets, and some of these statistics are overlapping, uh, but digital gadgets, the majority of Americans spend up to 12 hours a day in front of some type of screen, and the average person consumes five times more information every day than people did 50 years ago. And I really believe that. I mean, you always have information coming to you at a rapid speed, and it's amazing uh, what you can find out really quickly. And, uh, uh, you know, the information that is out there. And Now, you, once again, you need to be careful, because just because you can access information, it doesn't mean it's correct information. And let me uh, enlighten you in this. The other side is brilliant. They will intelligently pump out false information to get you sidetracked. And then when you focus on that thing, make you feel like an idiot when you, feel, when you find out, well, that really wasn't true anyway. So you have to be careful of your sources of information and where you get it from. But we have these digital gadgets, and the majority of Americans spend up to 12 hours a day in front of some type of a screen. That's a lot. That's a lot of time. Just, and that's not like Jeremy, where he has a job, his job, he has to do that. This is most Americans know. This is what they do outside of their job. They're just doing this, and kids are doing this. Uh, multiple cars. Now you find, well, why would multiple cars cause division? Well, listen, more than 35% of American households have three or more automobiles. Life has become so scheduled and busy, it's challenging uh, it is, it's challenging to live without multiple cars in one family. In other words, families have so much going on, they're being pulled in every which direction. This kid has a soccer game. This kid has a Boy Scout meeting. This one you know, is in music or something. you got all these different things pulling everybody apart. You have mom and dad going to their different jobs. And even, even with just me and Pamela in the house, uh, Sometimes uh, a giant wants her to, uh, to work in between services. And uh, she has to do that today. And so I'm sitting in the car. I'm sitting in the car for five minutes. I wonder, what is taking her so long? I'm looking at my watch and, man, what? And then I realize, oh, I don't have to wait on her. She's got to ride her own car. Amen? Because she's going to go to giant when she leaves her. So we have our own cars because we're being pulled with these different schedules. We're being pulled in different directions. And the more you're being pulled in different directions, the less time you have together as families. Uh, mobile phones. Here's a good one. Mobile phones, cell phones. More than one-third of Americans have three or more smartphones in their homes. This leads to a family's, uh, family member's being consumed with calls, texts, or social media. So here, you have all these people, and I'm not for kids having cell phones. I'm going to say that right now. To too much trouble they can get into with this. And then they get on social media, and then they can get sucked into all the bullying and all the garbage and stuff. Uh, and I realize in the day in which we live, we think we need these because, you know, what if something happens, and we got to contact each other. Well, I remember what my dad used to tell me when I was a kid. Didn't have cell phones. You had this thing on the wall. Now, once again, young people, I know this is hard for you to believe, 
but they had this thing in the wall about the size of a hymnal. It had like a, a hundred yard cord on it. Remember <laughs> a big old stretchy cord? And my dad always told me, he said, well, I'm going, he said, Bobby, make sure you have an emergency dime. An emergency dime. So once again, most people are, what in the world is an emergency dime? An emergency dime was so you could make a phone call if something happened. Because they had phone booths in those days. They literally had these booths where you could go in and make phone calls. Even had a phone book in the phone booth. Absolutely incredible. As we get older, these younger people have no idea what we're talking about. And they think, well, I need to have a cell phone so we can keep contact. I understand that. But I also understand that this can lead to a lot of problems. And then it leads to separation in families because everybody's texting, receiving texts, sending messages, social media, and people are spending more time looking at the screen. Like Linda told me with that one gathering, there was more time looking at the screen than looking at each other. And so it becomes dangerous. It becomes something that can divide the, the household and and uh, the, the, you know it can be very detrimental. Uh, surfing the internet off of a cell phone. It's amazing what you can do with these things. And that leads us into the internet. Number six, the internet. 90% of Americans regularly access the internet. Nine out of ten homes have access to the internet. The average usage of internet is nearly seven hours a day per person for those who have access to it in their homes. Absolutely incredible. Seven hours. You start adding all this stuff up together, people are spending more time uh, with whatever's out there, whatever's floating online, than they are with one another. And then they're like, they're like well, Pastor, I don't know what's wrong. Well, we have a problem communicating. You have a problem communicating because you've got too much junk in your life. Amen? Get rid of those cell phones, the computers, the social media. Get rid of that junk. If this stuff is not making your family stronger, then it is making it weaker, and you need to have the wisdom to know what to set aside. Amen? Or use it with wisdom. Use it with wisdom. So, uh, so you have uh, uh, social media. The average social media user spends two and a half hours a day on various social media platforms. And once again, laptops, computers, cell phones, they all can be used for social media. Here's a big one in the time in which we live. Extracurricular activities. Man, me, uh, me and uh, Jeremy went out yesterday putting out door hangers and no lie, man, those soccer fields were just loaded with kids, amen? Loaded with kids. Extracurricular activity. How much family time is really going on when that happens? How much time is being spent where people, kids are not even in church because of all these activities? I told a family one time, and uh, their kids were getting into baseball and playing baseball, and they said, well, we can't be here because we got a game and pastor, we want our kids uh, to know how to keep their commitment. Wait a second, isn't your commitment God, to God greater than a baseball team? Amen. So there's no, there's no thought about Forsake not the assembling of yourself together. Bye-bye, guys. Can't be there. You don't play on Sunday? I can't be there. I want to tell you, there was a fella. Oh, man, I wish I, I had his name in my head and I can't think of it now. He, he was... Uh, I, uh, I think he was Scottish, a missionary to China, uh, and, he, and he was a runner. Oh, what was his name? And he was definitely going to win the gold medal in his event. But he found out that his event was being Little was his name. His last name was Little. And he, and he was supposed to run, at, but his race was on Sunday, so he appealed to the people the people wouldn't change the race, so he says, then fine. I'm not going to run on, on Sunday. I'm a Christian, and I refuse to run on Sunday. His whole country was upset with him because there goes the gold medal. So he runs the next day. He runs in a race that he is not trained for, and he gets the gold medal. Amen? God honored his obedience. We live in a day where, man, 
every athlete plays on Sunday. I never heard of an athlete refuse to play on Sunday. Amen? And we have all these things, all these distractions to pull us out of church. So now, the statistic on extracurricular activities is 6 out of 10 children among average American households are involved in houses of, and, and hours, hours of extracurricular activities. This includes an endless list of school activities, sports, music, art, and so on. Wow. The list goes on. So I wonder why they're being pulled everywhere. I see this with my granddaughter. My granddaughter is in cheerleading and field hockey. and all. Man, you name it, she's getting involved with it. But then when it comes time to go to church, it's like, well, she can't go to church because she's got this activity or that activity. No, get rid of the activities for crying out loud. I'm tired of my granddaughter missing church because of stupid stuff. You know, cheerleader, give me a break. Come on now. Anybody can do that, right? I can share, but I, let, me, let me rephrase that. I cannot do flips, but I can share. <laughs> go. Amen, go. And let me tell you something. Those cheerleaders never made a difference while the game was going on. I never paid attention to a cheerleader while I was playing a game. I paid attention to them after the game. That's another problem. Amen? And that's another message. But listen, folks. We're letting extracurricular activities pull the family apart. Now, this isn't one or the other. This is all these things building up together. Building this pressure cooker ready to explode families. So what about these extracurricular activities? Well, this leads to financial stress. Why? Because nowadays you have to pay for a lot of what they do. It leads to uh, scheduling challenges because who's going to pick up, who's going to drop off, who's going to take who where. It also brings a disconnect between spouses because uh, they don't see each other as a result of time spent running all over the place with these kids to bring them to their events. And all this, you would you just say, oh, pastor, you're just exact. Am I exaggerating when the divorce rates are 52%, when families are fighting that, and wanting to kill each other, and natural affection is fading in homes. Am I exaggerating? I don't think so. Number nine, chemical addiction. Chemical addiction is destroying our families. You didn't deal with this so much back in the 50s. In the 60s you did, and forward it got worse and worse. More than 50% of the American population, that's the American population, very big number, more than 50% of the American population misuses prescription drugs. Rising abuse of prescription opioids, which has led to the heroin use and, recover, and, and record number of drug-related deaths. Record number of drug-related deaths. I was talking to a person about our RU program, and they said, hey, there, I was, they were talking to a police officer, and they said, listen, there's a couple of of convenience stores up here, but we need to get our RU uh, posters in there because the, the, the uh, police are always dragging people out of the restrooms ODing on something. They're like hot spots for drug use. And I'm telling you folks, there was a time where addiction programs really weren't needed in churches, but now they're needed in churches. And, with, and I'm not talking bad about anybody because any one of us could get addicted to anything at any moment. Amen? When we pass by that one church, Jeremy said, well, should I put it on the parsonage? I said, yeah, because we don't know if this guy's dealing with a problem. You know, he could have got hurt. He could have got put on opioids, and now he's addicted to opioids. You don't know. So let's put it, let's put it on the parsonage. Who cares? Amen? He might need help. So anybody could be in that situation. You don't know. And this is a bad situation where 50% of the American population misuses prescription drugs. And heroin, forget it, man. Forget it. That stuff is extremely addictive. So is cocaine and crack and all this other stuff. Extremely addictive. And then my last thing, as far as what's breaking up the family, is the pandemic. The, pandem the pandemic has been used to isolate and divide families. How many families have gone for months without seeing one another? 
How much in the church family has it affected churches where churches have closed for a year and their members have not come together for the fellowship that they need? It's not just listening to the message over the airways. It is coming together with one another. Amen? And fellowshipping with one another. Praying with one another. And all this stuff was dividing. All this stuff was dividing families. Kids were not seeing their grandparents because, oh well, you got the pandemic. Gotta watch out. I heard of families that were wearing masks in their home. I thought, no need. I'm not trying to offend anybody. So if I do, please don't be offended. But I gotta speak. Right? You're wearing a mask in your house with your own family? Just stupid. Just stupid. Amen? You're social distancing in the living room and around the kitchen table? Stupid. Get the mask off. Amen? You're in your own home for crying out loud. Amen. Talk to one another. Communicate. And just stop with the foolishness. This pandemic has been used to divide churches. It has been used to divide families. I'm telling you, study history. This pandemic's numbers are nowhere where all these other pandemics of the past have been. I was listening yesterday uh, to one of the speakers at the prophecy conferences talking about some of the challenges that Spurgeon was up against when cholera was running through uh, England. Never once did he not have a service. When Luther was facing a plague that was hitting Germany, never once did they close down the service. And those were serious plagues in those days. In fact, in those days, the Christians weren't hiding. The Christians were the frontline workers running headlong into it. But now the government says, oh, you can't have church, and boom, that's it. Everybody, weak spine, oh, closed down. Oh, we can't get together. Oh, this is dangerous. Well, oh, very dangerous. Do your homework. It's not as dangerous as everybody is saying. And don't you think it's interesting that nobody gets the flu anymore? Nobody gets the flu. Pamela just had the cold. She had the cold pretty bad last week. I knew in my heart, if she went to the doctor, they'd probably say it was COVID. Not even check it. Just, oh, it's COVID. Put her on the list. Check the list. 1,000 new COVID patients today. Did anybody ever stop to start adding all these figures up? How many people are in the state anyway? You're getting 3,000 new cases of COVID per day? How many people are in the state? I mean, come on. I know we have a lot of people. I know we have two cities worth. But folks, this stuff is being used to divide our families. What is causing us to be without natural affection? Television, computers, digital gadgets, multiple cars, mobile phones, the internet, uh, social media, extracurricular activities, chemical addictions, and pandemic. And I'll be quick with this as we end because we have to answer the question, well, what can we do to safeguard our families? What is it that we can do so that we don't fall into the category of without natural affection? Well, I'll be quick. First of all, there has to be a biblical commitment to our marriages. A biblical commitment to our marriages. Look in um, uh, Matthew chapter 19. That's the classic passage on marriage. We're certainly not going to go through the whole thing. We don't have time. But we have to have this commitment because this commitment lacks in America and it lacks in churches. And Matthew 19 in verses, uh, verses, um, uh, verses uh, 4 through 6, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and, and uh, they ask the question, uh, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? In other words, for whatever reason. No fault divorce. We have it in America. It runs rampant. This is what he says, verse number 4. And he answered and he said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning, made them male and female? Let me ask you this question. How many genders are there? Jesus said there was two, male and female. Facebook says there's 58. How in the world do you get 58? That's beyond me. 58. There's two, male and female. He said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain, the two of them, shall be one flesh. Amen? This is God's ideal. This is God's plan for the home. He says in verse 6, Wherefore, they are no more two, but one. There's a one flesh relationship, and there's no... 
uh, we're without natural affect, affection because uh, married couples aren't having that one flesh relationship. Amen? Wherefore, they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. In other words, don't let anybody divorce. How many lawyers are violating that verse? How many families are violating that verse? Because there is no commitment to biblical marriage. There's no commitment to biblical being a biblical husband and a biblical wife. And because there's a breakdown in women following their role and men following their role, and there ends up these divorces. And the way that I explain this to the teens is I say, you take two pieces of cardboard, very nice, clean and shiny, and you glue them together, amen? Let them sit for a while. They now become one. And when you go to tear it apart, what do you have? You have it all looking rough and nasty, a little bit cardboard here, a little bit cardboard here, because what you pull apart, what God has joined together, when you pull it apart, just like the cardboard, it creates pain. It creates more problems. It creates agony. And there's no, anybody that's been through a divorce, you know what I'm saying is true. And I'm not getting down on anybody that's been through a divorce. Things happen, I understand, but that's over, now we move forward, amen? And now we know what we need to do as we face the marriage that we're in. Okay? I'm not saying anything here because I want divorced people to feel bad. That's the furthest thing from my mind. Any one of us, myself included, could be divorced. But when the thing happens, then you have to move on and you know what to do in the next relationship. Amen? That's what you have to do. You have to have a biblical commitment. Now, not only do we have to have a biblical commitment to our marriage, but we have to have a biblical commitment to our children. Look at Ephesians 5 real quick. Ephesians 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 6. And notice what the word... Or Ephesians 6, rather. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 4. Ephesians 6 verse number 4. Notice what the Word of God says. And ye fathers, who's to take the lead in the home? According to the Word of God. Fathers, amen? What, what's the problem with America today is fathers are not taking the lead in the home. How many times do you see athletes being interviewed that were raised in single parent homes? Most of them, Amen? Most of these kids were raised without guidance and without any concept of money or anything, and they're raised in poverty. They get a million dollar contract and they just blow it because they just don't know better. Absolutely incredible. What's the pro No father in the home. A father, a godly father, too, not just any old father, but a godly father in the home is what kids need to stabilize a family. He says, and you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. In other words, don't be getting them upset for no reason at all. You know, sometimes we can do that as dads. We can discipline in a wrong way or in a selfish way, right? Ah, you're kind of bothering me. Get out of here. And you get them angry, amen? Or you're picking on them for stuff that doesn't matter and you let the stuff that does matter go. And so he says, he says, Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up. How? In the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. How do I bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the, war, of the, of the Lord? Well, first of all, there needs to be family devotions. There needs to be praying and reading Scripture together. Amen? Together. You bring them to church. You don't let them sit home. While you go to church, you bring them to church because that's what you've been commanded to do. Amen? Abraham was told by God that he one of the things that he appreciated about Abraham was that Abraham would command his family in the right way. Amen? We don't have commanders in the family. I'm not saying you have to be a dictator, but you have to be a leader. Amen? And it's up to you. If you're waiting for your child to come and say, hey, Read me the Bible. That ain't going to happen most likely. You have to take the initiative and say, hey, let's look at this. Even a Bible book for little people. Amen? I loved it about Ken and Lori. They were big on the whole family reading the Bible together. And I'll never forget when Ken asked Lori, uh, uh, not Lori, uh, the, the, the girl, Lily. He, he asked Lily. He said, Lily, do you know what all the red words in the Bible are? She said, yeah, those are Jesus' words. 
And then she said, and the black words are all Pastor Bob's. <laughs> I thought, well, yeah, she, at least she's on to something. Amen. <laughs> All right, so you've you got to pray and read Scripture together and bring them to church. That's how you nurture and admonition. I ain't got time to keep going on in these things, but you, you, you get what it, I'm giving you the basics of what you can do to keep from having unnatural affection and keeping your family from drifting apart. A third thing is to cut back on, cut back or put out of your life the things that are stealing from your family. And that list I gave you, plus and more that could be put to that list, if there's something that's pulling your family apart, that's robbing and stealing from your family, you need to put that out. Amen? Put that out. And it's not church. Because a lot of people start there when they start, well, church is consuming too much of my time. No, it's that other junk you're doing that's consuming too much of your time. Amen? And when I was in Florida, we... Uh, had a, 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 an elderly couple started coming to our church there in Florida. And so I went by to see them. And I said, hey, it's great to have you in our church and services. Uh, uh, what led you to come to our church? And she said, well, uh, for the, he, I'm, I'm Methodist and he's Baptist. And when we got married, we agreed that for the first 50 years we'd be Methodist. And then the next remaining time we'd be Baptist. So the 50 years is up, so now I have to be a Baptist. And I said, wow, that's interesting. I didn't know how to respond. I said, that's interesting. I said, so, uh, so, so how do you like our church? She said, I like your church, and, and, uh, and the evening service is interesting. She said, you know, in the Methodist church that I grew up in, we used to have night vespers on Sunday night. It's just like your, your evening service. But we had to stop doing it. I said, well, why was that? Oh, because everybody wanted to stay home and watch Bonanza. I said, so they had to choose between the evening service and Bonanza, and they chose Bonanza. And so now you know why the Methodist church went from the fastest growing to the fastest dying. Amen? And choosing the wrong things will kill your family. A fourth thing to safeguard your family is just simple spending time together. Doesn't cost money, doesn't have to be fancy. Spending time together. I see often posted on Facebook, don't mean to embarrass anybody, but Jason, picture with the kids, amen, fishing. Did you get any fish? That's, uh, well, but the important thing is you were together. That's, what's in, that's what safeguards the family, amen? Time spent together doing simple things. You don't have to run off to Disney. Disney's liberal anyway. You don't have to run off to that garbage. But just spending time together can safeguard your family. And then the very last thing, very simple, just be Christ-like. If a husband and a wife will commit themselves to be Christ-like, man, it will safeguard your family in tremendous ways that you'd never imagine. But you've got to be willing to do it together. If you don't safeguard your family, then the only other option is our natural affection, which will develop over time. And God said it was, a time, it was a sign of the last days. And our natural affection runs rampant in our families. It does. So many other things I could have added to this that are just ripping it apart. But we as Christians can make a change and a difference. Amen? And then be a witness to our neighbors. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father and God, we thank You for this time together. We thank You for the Holy Word of God. And Lord, so much here to share. I pray I didn't bring an overload, God, but I pray I bring enough that we can see that all these gadgets and all these things in our life that are, that are causing distraction, that perhaps we would better handle them. Not that we have to get rid of every TV and cell phone, but we just have to manage it properly. So Father, help us to have the wisdom and help us as men to be leaders in our homes, dear God, fulfilling the role you caused us to, uh, uh, fulfilling the role that you've given to us, dear God. Help the ladies to fulfill their role. Help the children to look up with respect to their mom and dad and to others around them and be willing, everybody in the family, be willing to be Christ-like in all that we say and do. Father, bless the invitation now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
All right, so if Jeremy will come and lead us in a hymn of invitation, Cindy will play for us. And perhaps somebody needs to come. Perhaps there's things uh, in your family, in your relationship, in your walk with God uh, you just need to deal with. He says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He says that we can redeem the time. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. We can take back what the devil has taken. We can move forward in victory. It is possible, God. Guys, God can do so much, but it begins with us humbly bowing before Him and saying, God, I mess things up and I need your help. And He will answer and He will help you. If someone's here, you don't know that if you're, if you're saved, you don't know if you die, you go to heaven. Then when the invitation starts, you come. You come and we show you the Bible only, how you can know for sure that when you die, heaven will be your home. Amen? Let's all stand as we sing hymn number 245. 245, I am praying for you. Savior is pleading in glory, a dear loving Savior, the earth friends be few, and now he is watching in tenderness o'er me, but oh that my Savior was your Savior too. For you I am praying, for you I am praying, for you I am praying, I'm praying for you. I have a Father to me, He has given a hope for eternity, bless and true and soon he will call me to meet him in heaven but oh that he let me bring you with me too for you I am praying for you 